all you lovely marketing people out there. This is Mike Doyle, and welcome to the Drive80.com unnamed podcast, where the point of the show is to answer the question, how do I market my videos? In this episode, we talk to my good buddy, Chris Coleman, who works over at Ogilvy in New Jersey. I met Chris years ago when I just started freelancing. Uh, I was doing a lot of flash work back at the um, back in the day, and I got connected with Chris, went and worked for Common Health for a couple weeks, and then he ended up giving me a really good referral to my buddy Thomas over at uh, Group, C- Group DCA when that was still a company, and uh, I got uh, I did a lot of work there, but I stayed in contact with Chris through the years. He's always posting about the things that he's researching. He just is super smart with marketing. He's just got the technical side down, uh, got the creative side down. This guy is just fucking great. I thought he'd be a great guest because of all the campaigns that he's run for his company. And I was really happy with the way this show came out. In this episode, we're going to touch on a few topics, which are when they have interns over at Ogilvy, how they like to listen to what these guys are utilizing for their platforms uh, for marketing or video, like what what is on their phone, what's capturing their attention, how it would be awesome to be targeted by Tylenol for hangovers. That was a pretty interesting conversation. Um, how to turn every satisfied customer into an advocate with this program called Storyvine. How you can make your brand top of mind before someone's ready to even make a purchase, and a ton more. Now, before we get yeah, before we begin, please subscribe to the podcast, and if you are listening on YouTube. Please comment below with any questions, like the video, subscribe to the channel, share this with anyone who's into marketing who can get some really good value out of it. Or if you have a lot of knowledge yourself about a certain platform with video or marketing with video, please reach out to me, Mike at Drive80.com. I'd love to have you on, especially if you can talk about a specific campaign that you've run and you had some success with it. And um, yeah, so this episode, again, I've been doing this for a couple episodes, totally for free because I I love my buddy Nick Berry, Uh, will be brought to you by SendLift.com. SendLift takes out the hassle of writing handwritten cards for your clients or leads and does it for you. So you just log in, you upload a spreadsheet, and voila, handwritten cards will be sent to prospects um, or clients, I think whoever you decide to. So check it out, SendLift.com. So here we go. Drive80.com, unnamed podcast with our guest, Chris Coleman of Ogilvy. So Chris, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, so thank you for the intro. Um, you know, as, as Mike uh, had noted previously, we had been colleagues. He's a developer and designer, and that's kind of my background. I learned, uh, um, learned as I went. Uh, creative director, developer, now uh, digital strategy, kind of combining everything together. And uh, I work inside of the pharmaceutical and healthcare advertising space, so a lot of regulated pieces. Um, but we've been trying to use video for for quite a while. I think going back to when um, when we first worked together, we were using video inside of Flash websites as a as, as a guide to help drive through uh, through navigation and some you know intro. Um, as was uh, as was the trend back then, we were using video intros for for just about everything on the web. Um, which it was pretty interesting if you look at you know from a usability perspective it's it's just c- kind of completely counterintuitive to a lot of situations, but uh, even back then we were trying to use video and video prompts inside of navigation to begin to tell a story and um, I think not only have the channels matured but also um, the devices and how we're using them has changed quite a bit. We look at uh, channels like Snapchat and uh, uh, Instagram Stories. Um, YouTube, we're really talking about the dissemination of media and video lends itself so well to that. Um, and also in, you know, everybody's walking around with a production studio in their pocket now. Um, I, you know, I think you're, you know, um, your, your, your business there is, is aggressively pointing um, towards what can be done, um, to really compete inside of the space with, um, with Moxie and a lot of, a lot of drive, a lot of success. Um, and, and that should be the way it is, right? That's indicative of what the opportunity is inside of the marketplace. And, uh, you know, looking at what you do with, um, with videos and being able to tell, um, use animations to tell those narratives and to really bring, um, a, a, an emotion an ethos and education level, um, deliver it with pictures, music, um, and tonality. I think that's part of why video is so successful, whether or not it's animation or, um, actually captured footage. And when we look at, you know, what's happening with, how video is changing culture. It's um, 
it is so critical for every brand to be able to try to take advantage. And for anybody who's in the market to do a business, whether or not you're selling um, pizzas, cars, pharmaceutical products, it video is really a way to quickly um, deliver messaging and to do so in a way um, when used properly that can be really empathetic and, and really be able to drive what's going on um, inside of um, your head as a, as a marketer and also um, begin to touch people in, in a little bit different way. Um, I know you had uh, asked me previously, you know, like, well, how are you using uh, video inside of the, uh, inside of, you know, your job? Um, you know, work for a large agency. We do um, a lot of uh, mechanisms of action explaining how drugs and therapies work, and that's, that's nothing new. But um, why we do it is because video really delivers a huge amount of value, being able to show things visually, be able to use a score to be able to change what the temperament is. Um, inside of a regulated industry, that's very hard to do because very rarely can you actually use language to do it. Um, you can't imply um, you know, the success of a product through language very directly in many cases. Um, so we count on being able to use um, illustrations of what's going on inside of your body with a score, with a pacing in order to deliver that. Um, and also you know, what we're seeing inside of being able to put people together, being able to show what that emotional um, what that emotional burden is for patients who are suffering from the disease and also the, the healthcare professionals who are treating them. Um, video is very powerful for that. And, and you know, that's, it's almost trite, right? Um, being able to use picture, people telling stories. I mean, yeah. that's like you know, what the evening news does, but it's really um, something that allows people to bond with one another. People, um, people want to see um, themselves in a lot of other people's stories and being able to put another patient up there really makes them feel that they're not alone. And it's a very powerful aspect of video. Um, you had also asked me um, previously, you know, like how are we seeing that being used? And I think that is a lot of what has changed previously. When we were first, you know, first met each other and beginning to, to work together, you were really counting on, you know, the, the brand.com to deliver a lot of that value, right? We were sending, using banner ads, um, search engine marketing to send users to um, a brand.com and uh, for them to watch, you know, a video. We we're asking them for their time. And I think the model that's changed is we're going out to a lot of other channels and exactly like you're doing with your business model, right? Let's, let's go where our, our audience is. Being able to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, Vimeo, whatever that whatever that channel is that is appropriate for your audience and being able to get into that level of targeting really provides us a, a, a frictionless way to get to get to our audience. Um, and I, I think that that is what's, you know, what's changed quite a bit is all of these platforms that our users are uh, are, are on are supporting video. Um, I think the most go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I was I, I was just thinking because you had mentioned all these platforms and then, you know, we both know that you're in the pharmaceutical space and I'm thinking about Snapchat is the one thing that stands out to me. You said Snapchat, yes. you said pharmaceuticals and I'm thinking about how I interact on social media, the things that I can call bullshit real fast. If something is, I know if someone's trying to sell me, if it's, if it's a song and dance, like, Hey, buy our crap. But in the, you know, I, yeah. I, I hate that stuff, but if something gets me, I, I just like, like I want to hug it. I'm like, Oh my God, like you are doing this so well. And I'm thinking if I was on a platform like Snapchat, it's got to be, the story has to be told so specifically and so well, depending on what the product is in a pharma space. You can't just come out and say like, you know, you would probably have a heart condition right now, but if they wrap around the story a little bit in, in a different aspect, instead of just saying that where it could be, a genuine story or something funny. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, that, that's to me it, it, when you guys are using something like Snapchat. Yeah. I'm kind of going a little bit off track, but if you are using Snapchat, like how are you doing that in pharma? Uh, I think, you know, not to talk to the specifics, but I think, you know, what, and it, you know, it comes back to one of the things and, and you, you, you nailed it. Like we, you know, we're fortunate enough to work for a large agency, right? We've got a lot of interns that come in every year. Yeah. One of the first things we do is take advantage of them and not like advantage of them, but you know, invite <laughs> them in and say out. like, Hey, <laughs> Hey, tell us. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to get myself in trouble. You're asking me about editing. You, you, yeah. right to there. you take advantage the, um, of their knowledge in that space. Yeah. They're literally and, living on it. At and the ask job. them like, tell me what brands you're following and why. Um, there was a study that, that just came out, it just came out, uh, I think it was an eMarketer, that 50% of the brands um, that are 
uh, you know, 50% of the things that are clicked on inside of, in Snapchat are brand stories. And I think a lot of us don't look at brands the, the way they are when we begin to, uh, to engage with media. But when you go into the discovery section of Snapchat, it is all brands. It's just whether or not it's news media or outlet or, or content creators, those are brands. And even the influencers are, are who are there, um, you know, it's a shame to call them, you know, like influencers, but they're selling their access to an audience. Yeah, and when yeah. we begin to look at that, you know, that that is something that, you know, Pharma can get engaged in. In particular, you know, we, we spend a lot of time challenging our clients is, you know, what do we have the authority and the permission to speak to? And I think you need to look at that with a very sensitive lens that are that's very channel specific. You know, Facebook's very quickly become, you know, a, a paid space you know it allows us to do tar- you know paid targeting very accurately and easily um but when you get into these new and emerging channels that are um you know really owned by a, by a smaller niche of the audience that's where a lot of the sensitivity comes in is to like oh you know we won't ever see a healthcare brand there and i can I, you know even when we were working together previously and that was in the early days of twitter like hey, can a brands get into you know can a healthcare brand get into twitter yeah you know, um, when you look at brands um, that are, go a little bit beyond lifestyle brands, um, I think it needs to become relevant to a smaller audience. But if you're, um, if you're local hospital, um, if you're an expectant mother and your local pediatric ward, um, especially at a large hospital network, is offering news about what moms are going through right then and that can become mm-hmm. relevant to you, you could see very quickly that that becomes something that could be of great value. And the intimacy of Snapchat allows you to have these kind of quick bites as an ongoing narrative. Well, now, like, okay, start to adapt that to, you know, um, I, Obgine, um specialty products that could be targeted off of that or begin to look at what happens when you get into lifestyle drugs. There are a lot of diseases that actually impact a very young audience and isolates them. Um, being able to use some of these channels to be able to um, create a bond to another um, patient is a space that works really well. And I think one of the things that healthcare does inside in the limits of being a regulated industry allows us to have um, a lot of burden of validation, a lot of burden of, you know, being able to validate that something is um, is safe or something is going to be uh, appropriate. And we should be taking advantage of that by making sure that we're either curating content or aligning, um, you know, patients or even healthcare professionals with uh, authoritative, really valued um, sources of information. And that that's yeah. channel agnostic. I think, yeah, face, you know, Snapchat's a bit of a stretch for a lot of healthcare brands. Um, but, uh, you know... Well, if you are going to be on... So let's say if you are using Snapchat as an avenue, it's more so it's it's more about brand awareness and because a lot of the pharma, pharmaceutical drugs have to be prescribed and you know there's the prescription drugs and there's also the you know just aspirin over the counter drugs um, and you know and which side of the fence are utilizing something like Snapchat? Yeah, but I think you know that. You, well, you're asking me specifically what brands are on. Well, I mean, are they using it for brand awareness, or are they using yeah. it for hey? Because in, uh, Instagram Stories now, it's w- the specific users who have the ability to sl- swipe up. It goes directly to a landing page within there. We could have a button, click and buy now, right? Yeah, but I think more than that, they're really looking for a share of voice, right? If you look at something like pain medication, like you know, your, your Advils, your Tylenols of the world. Um, when you look at who's actually making those purchasing decisions, in many cases, you know, you're talking about a really in-demand audience, you know, yeah. you're talking about, um, someone who may be head of household for making medical decisions. That's more likely than not a, you know, kind of quote unquote, our millennial mom, you know, yeah, I just kind of threw up in my mouth saying it out loud. But when we begin to segment these audiences and look who's actually on these channels, um, yeah, you know, you, you need to be able to understand how you fit into this person's life. And when they do give you that few minutes and they're not just racing, you know, racing over because you don't have an irrelevant message, like where do you find relevance? And I, I think that, sorry, I totally cut you off, but I mean, my mind just starts going into creative sense. If Tylenol had the balls, it'd be amazing to do ads specifically on Snapchat to people with hangovers. That college crowd is get up in the morning. First thing, I mean, I'm 37 and I get up in the morning, I go right to my phone and start seeing what's going on online. If I was getting targeted with, if I was in yeah. college waking up, they're probably like, oh God, it's like, you know, you're feeling like complete hell right now. I'd be like, oh, hell yeah. You know, it's like, oh, now I can, I, oh, that, that brand was awesome. It spoke to me. I'm going to go run out and get Tylenol instead of Excedrin because 
they're speaking to my world. And it, it, it is a very aggressive approach, but yeah, that is no, I can say that. Look, I mean, we have a lot of lot of brands who are who are talking about this. I just think it's it's a question of, you know, are you going to find the spot to be, you know, brave enough with your your. And the thing is, you're actually talking over a lot of these channels, like such a, it's 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 actually more costly to get them through the the creative and regulatory process than it is to actually, you know, buy a lot of the the ad oh, space. I know that. I know that very well. But it, it, it's going to change. I mean, like, you know, look, look, look. I would think look like at this. Me, I've got quite a few years on you, but you're quickly <laughs> racing towards middle age, right? <laughs> you're, you know, you're talking about, you know, you need pain medicine after you go out at night. Well, you know, welcome to the oh, party. Oh, man, I said, trust me, I would go hard in my early 20s where I needed <laughs> aspirin because I was like, my God, that was way too much bourbon last night or whatever the hell I was drinking. But I think in that aspect, there's the, the company will put the video out in that space, but I think it's if they can get the audience to share it with that language, and that's a home run to me. Like for me, right? I I'm someone who's very I'd like to joke around with the things that I post. I would almost take that and say, "Hey, I saw this ad. If you feel a like complete ass right now, you should probably do that. You were at the party last night. You should go take this." Be- if I felt the need to do that, in that sense, it would work a little bit better. Where they're like, "Hey, we got the regular." T- you know, regulatory because we spoke in our legal way, but this, now our audience is now speaking the way that we want to really speak, but legally can't. Yeah, I think there, there's two things, you know, when you begin to look at like larger advertising opportunities, when you begin to look at, and I think Snapchat fits into the category of being like a multi channel solution, right? You're, you can go rarely hard at Snapchat, but I think you're going to need several other surface areas in order oh, yeah. to really have an effective advertising right what what you're trying to do is is instill a lexicon into your into your audience's mind like you want to own something in search that's unique you want to own something at the shelf that's unique you want to own something in a dialogue with your physician that's unique yeah. so what you're trying to do is actually very difficult and and working inside of a channel like snapchat that could be very fruitful which is you want the, them to change a lot of how they're addressing their their mental consideration, their thought process, right? Yeah. You want them to start to think in different terminology and something that's wholly owned by the brand. Um, you know, that's where you get into these weird spaces that I mean, a lot of brands in the the eighties and nineties were experimenting with like really just trying to tilt the market, you know, look at like Pepsi Clear. Yeah. And you know, a lot a lot of these brand experiments that had gone on that were really trying to trying to own a specific space by like just dousing the market with you know, opportunity. And you see that in test markets now where, where brands are trying to do a lot of different things. You know, we'll tell you when you begin to talk about the idea of authenticity. Um, we've worked with a brand called um, Storyvine. And Storyvine allows the users to, um, to uh, a brand to work with either advocates or pre-assigned, um, you know, patient or healthcare professional groups or any audience, right? And they can download the application, log in, and they need a um, username and password in order to have access to a template. That template asks them questions, and they can use the phone and selfie motor. They can have somebody um, videotape them, and they get prompted just like this, you know, just going back and forth with a number of questions. And what's recorded um, section by section in uh, two to three minute snippets is then included automatically on the server with a, a front end and a back end, you know, bumpers, so to speak, and yeah. also the title cues asking the questions. So what you get is this really high level um, production that's encoded on a server that, uh, you know, someone who's in charge of managing the messaging can download and deploy into market. And you have, you know, a really an, an audience member, uh, you know, a brand advocate who's activated, right, who's cares enough or is motivated enough to actually um, film themselves and, and have a conversation about the brand and then be able to deploy that in market and do it quickly and easily because there's really no um post-production assigned to that yeah um, that, I mean, that, that's that, that's yeah. like the success of all these these um these out these channels now because the 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 time it takes to produce something if you're going to do it really well is so time consuming but if you can just pick your phone up record something and get it out within a second like i can take i have a youtube app on my phone i was vlogging for a little bit so what i would do is i would go in a room i turn the phone on i turn the camera on i would start talking about a topic i'd be done and upload it directly to you my youtube channel it would be right there and ready to go within a second and it was i didn't have and then yeah it's, it's quick and it's dirty 
but it's fast content and you can kind of balance that out with the polish stuff but with something like this you can get it right there and it sounds like there's a mix though of polish in that yeah i you know it does a lot of the encoding and they they um you know they're open to you know produced creative um or you know they, they've also helped uh, you know quite a few of our clients in, in build the creative themselves but what you you have is a really nice fit and finish yeah. Um, that can be deployed into market, you know, literally minutes later if you have, uh, you know, community manager or somebody working with you. But I, what I really like is it, it allows the user to be engaged in this production process. It gives you a nice frame where to put your head, ask you the questions. So you really don't need anybody, um, you know, helping you. I mean, it's really it, it's effective to just hold the phone up in selfie mode and be able to capture that. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, we, we've looked at it as how to activate, you know, patients and and uh, physicians who are in market, you know, really getting them to work with us in that part of that process. But it could be equally as effective for someone like you who could be giving out, um, you know, uh, post consultation, uh, you know, follow ups and, you know, really turn every satisfied customer into uh, an advocate um, and being able to publish that content, you know, and really have this running dialogue of your success stories that are right in the first person voice of who you've done the work for. What was the name of it again? Uh, Storyvine. Storyvine. Every episode I've done, I swear, dude, I always take something out of it and, and execute with it right away. So this is great. Yeah, and I, you know, we'll say that, that whether or not it's, it's you know Facebook Live or um, you know I, I know Twitter's integrated a lot of the video production stuff that was in Periscope into their yeah. uh, you know their first party apps. Um, I think it's really about not being afraid and really like running into market and being able to do these things and not being afraid to 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 amortize those things. You know. Um, it, it's, you know, one video is not just thrown away once. The second you have that captured, you could certainly slice it, dice it, cut it up a bunch of different ways, whether or not you're going to use it as, you know, verbatims, as audio inside of a podcast, as live video that's done right inside of the moment, and then being able to do some light editing to it and be able to use that as smaller sections along the way. Video yields just such a tremendous amount of flexibility um, and not only what you could do with it, but what you could do with it retrospectively and being able to slice several videos taken at different times together. Oh, yeah. And I think that's hugely overlooked. Um, I think a lot of people take advantage of the, the real-time aspects of you know, Facebook Live in particular and Instagram stories. But being able to look retrospectively into how you begin to use this and tell a narrative. And um, you know, you're telling me about the podcast and how you've you know, already cut um, several of these you know, together in a relatively short amount of time. You know. Being at the end of the year, being able to, to supercut these and being able to pull out some key insights, yeah, you know, you, you're sitting on top of a huge set of not just you know creative, but also data. You know, all the different perspectives that you're capturing along the way, those insights can be published as a you know a proprietary data set. And, oh yeah, you know, every, everybody's just capturing all this information all the time, not just brands but people. I mean, that's kind of what the family photo album was supposed to be, and now all of us walking around with these with phones in our pockets capturing data all the time and it's this insurmountable collection of data and i think being able to to take that and you know look at google photos right what that does with your videos if you're uploading those and it literally will create super cuts of weekends of trips really? i didn't even know this google has like the most boss products <laughs> um if you haven't fooled around with it um you're an ios guy right yeah yeah i am too if you download the google um google apps um, uh, application, right? Google Photos application. Um, you can back up your photos to it. But say, for instance, you know, you're about to go out for a weekend, mountain biking or whatever. Um, you know, take a photo in your car, take a couple of photos as you go, take some video as you go. You come back home, get to Wi Fi, it pulls all that data. It understands that you started in point A, gone to point B, fooled around in point B, come back to point A again, and it considers that a trip. You do it over President's Day weekend, literally smart enough to say, here's your President's Day weekend. It splices the video together with the still photos with some Ken Burns effects, overlays a score automatically. No charge, no, just uses that data and does a reasonably good job of it's like crazy. putting together, you know, some short trips for me. But what it does is like, come on, who would have sat down outside of, outside of, you know, video guru like yourself, sat down and, and cut their own video? Yeah. You know, I mean, even, you, even if you know how to, to edit video, I mean, I know how to, I know to edit video, I know to do animations, but I also know how long it takes. And that knowledge of how long it takes makes me not want to sit down and do it. But things like this, I'll use, and I think a lot of people who are creatives, they'll see these applications and go, well, that, 
you know, that's not done the right way. But when you can take your creative Done. mind and actually utilize these apps, you can spin it a little bit to make it look better in your creative eye. And it just saves you so much freaking time. You're like, holy shit, I can't believe yeah. this. And, and look at it, even YouTube has a video inter interface there. And these were tools that were like hundreds and thousands of dollars you know, per software package several years ago. All these companies are giving this away. And you know that's why you know half the content that you see inside of the stream is not just because the, the you know the algorithm points to that's what people engage with, but you know Facebook and Twitter like that's the kind of stuff we're expecting to see. That's what the things we're expecting to be entertained with, you know, when we begin to go through the feed, and you know we're we're just looking for that like dopamine rush of engaging with another piece of content, and uh, you know that's the same thing for some reason you know and i'll talk about healthcare because i know other industries are a little bit different but you know healthcare we're that's what we're competing with you know we're competing for just that few minutes of uh, extra time to be um be exposed to an audience member whether or not it's a healthcare professional patient nurse caregiver doesn't matter like it's it's still the same stream of you know competitive information when somebody sits down on their couch patients don't you know don't stop being people because they're sick and, you know, physicians don't go home and, you know, pour themselves over Grey's Anatomy, you know, go home and sit in front of the tube, like with three devices, like, you know, like anybody else does. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. And that's where, you know, we're, we're, you know, like the mind shift needs to happen in regards to creating content. So let's talk about some, cause we're, we're about, we're pretty close to 30 minutes and I think we've touched on a couple of things. I really like to get some real life examples because people, tend to you know you can throw some statistics at people in different applications but it comes down to what can you do with it and people love real life s stories of you know i did this and this is what happened after it um so can you like speak to some campaigns or like a campaign you did recently where you were you had video you had a bunch of video whatever and you're like yeah we laid it out like this and this is how we utilized it in this space yeah, I can't talk about specific clients, but That's I will fine. talk about real life examples, right? So um, Storyvine's another one of those really good examples where we were able to give patients um, access to record themselves and tell the story about what it was like to, um, to be living with um, cancer, uh, specific uh, uh, oncology specifically. And you really got a chance to hear their narrative. Some of them were hopeful. Some of them were, you know, a little bit more pessimistic. But what you were hearing were people. Um, in a, you know, not in a very edited state, not, not well lit, not, you know, Wrong. not with somebody, pro you know, really prodding them with specific questions and, you know, handing them a tissue, but to really hear their perspective on what it was like to live with the disease. Um, and being able to take these assets and we collected them, you know, as a, you know, a part of a patient journey that was, that was provided into market. Um, it was really one of our most, I think, ambitious campaigns in regards to engaging that audience. And not something that would have been possible five, six years ago. Not something that, you know, without the proliferation of, you know, devices that are able to, to really record high quality video in your pocket. And, every, and listen, you know, like, you know, is it like 70, 80 percent of the recent statistic of Americans have some kind of smartphone? And chances are it's a pretty recent smartphone. So being able to capture video that way is really um, a unique opportunity. It completely undoes the burden of being able to deal with, you know, pr uh, you know production teams, flights, you know, of being able to put people on flights to be able to get them out there to record people and that being a limited factor and the people having time. Um, you know, that was something that we had seen and I know that we're looking forward to being able to use that, um, that content to do targeted media um, inside of um, both Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, talk about that. Um, like, what, what would you, so you have all this content now then, it, so you haven't actually dispersed it yet. It's, it's not live. Um, it is live. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna share the client with you just yet. Yeah, yeah um, no, that's totally fine. Uh, can you talk but, uh, about though, like where it is live or how? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's that'd um, be great. The technical aspects of it. Yeah, inside of uh, inside of healthcare, we have uh, you know the idea of an uh, unbranded disease awareness website. So it's uh, not associated with a particular brand, but rather provided to as a service to patients um, and physicians who are trying to understand the disease state um, into market. Um, what that does is allows the pharmaceutical manufacturer to have access to an audience and be able to provide them um, value and build up their understanding of the, their disease so that they can ask better questions of the physicians and become their own advocates. And for physicians to understand where these patients are in their journey. I think as a physician, you could quickly um, you know, be very wrapped up in, in the clinical 
uh, aspects of, and not understand necessarily the burden of disease. Um, and those are just some of the aspects as to why you would use a, a site that wasn't associated with a brand. But um, these unbranded websites allow the industry to have a little bit more creative flexibility in regards to how they're actually using uh, uh, communication channels. So you see a lot of social media um, using this. Um, so this is a, uh, you know, a dot com that's uh, put into market to really help patients understand what that burden of disease looks like, what it's like to live with the disease, to hear the stories of other people who are living with the disease, and for us to be able to, um, you know, provide services to them, not only in asking the right questions to their physician, but simply being able to be aligned with, um, you know, an advocacy group, um, access information, and be a little bit better equipped to be their own, um, you know, uh, more competent in understanding exactly what's going on in the disease state, not only hearing that first person, but, you know, also through the information that we're providing. Yeah. Um, still regulated. Um, so we've collected all of the videos that we've captured through the Storyvine solution and put them into market um, on, cur you know, curated as one collection on, on this dot com. So how are you seeing it? Like, how are you seeing, res you know, what you consider results or uh, what you consider success? Like, how are you tracking all that? Oh, yeah. So we have a couple of different metrics for success. Um, the, the first is the, the length of video that we, we typically see users engaged with. And I think we're seeing anywhere between two and three times the, um, the amount of video and time being consumed. Um, typically, you know, I try to take a little bit different approach in regards to you can break up any narrative. And if it's, if it's consistent questions like it was done through Storyvine, it's very easy to kind of create general, um, general performance metrics around first, second, third question. Um, so if you're getting, you know, assume there's a question every two minutes and you're getting six minutes into it, um, as an average, you're getting three questions, right? Um, how those questions are loaded and how far you get into that narrative helps us understand how successful that video is. So when you talk about length of engagement, you know, not only are you beginning to um, get just long, you know, longer amount of time as stickiness, so to speak, as a marketing surface. But what we're actually doing is being able to deliver much more of the narrative and understand, you know, if 60% of our audience saw the first three out of the six questions that somebody was asked, well, you're talking about delivering half of the information, you know, half of the payload, so to speak. Um, what we're also seeing is a different kind of audience coming to these sites. Um, we're seeing um, a lot more focus on the actual patient, patient and caregiver, people who are engaged with understanding that, rather than you know what we've seen a lot of um, healthcare sites, which is um, you know being able to use search and drivers to 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 bring an audience in. You know, at the beginning of a journey, when you're trying to create awareness around the disease, it has a lot of inaccuracy built into it, right? Yeah. If you're gonna, if you were just diagnosed with diabetes, chances are that you're, the narrative that you're going to be using search and um, patient tools to get to is going to be like, you know, I have diabetes, which just diagnosed with diabetes, type two diabetes. It's very vague. Yeah. Um, once you've been a patient for um, a little while, you become much more sophisticated in how you're looking at things. Right. You're beginning to look at a specific kind of insulin. Um, whether or not it's an injectable or an oral, whether or not um, you have a preference to one specific manufacturer or the other, how you expect to be, um, you know, what are your questions around access and being reimbursed by your insurance? Um, what's the frequency at which you're going to be switching therapies? And, and so those videos, though, would probably, those videos would be viewed longer because it's, it is specific to your question. It's like, I really need to know this now. Like, I know I'm in it. I know what this looks like. I'm going to watch this because I, I literally need to get an answer right now to make something happen. Not always because um, people's tolerance to watching, you know, intro or, right, you know, think about it. If you're, if you're you know, someone who's working on a brand and you're going to create just one or two videos because, you know, inherently they're expensive to produce old school way, right? Yeah. But you're going to do something that's going to serve the widest amount of your market. If you're an experienced patient, you actually want to get to the, the meat of this. Yeah, so. Like don't give me all the fluff. It's like when you go to see a YouTube a tutorial that's free, this guy or girl exactly. took time, and they talk for the first five minutes. You're like, dude, just freaking get to what I need, and I want to right. get out. Right. And this, that's exactly, you know, why I was so excited to talk to you is because the, these are the changes that need to actually happen is us understand like, well, how do I create videos that are more and more pertinent to specific aspects of the journey? But how do I, how do I reach the audience and tell them that yeah. that's where they are inside of their journey. Um, even mm -hmm. even in your, your video narratives, like if you're going to talk to you know a, a customer that you've had twice or three times already, you explaining them the value of, of video to their marketing, you know, at twice. a general, yeah, going to be yeah. kind of useless. You need to get into their business 
their needs, where, where their audiences are. And that's where you need to start making some decisions about where you exist in the marketplace. And this is something inherently from a video standpoint, um, healthcare has a little bit, a uh, little bit of a journey to go. Yeah. I think from a tech standpoint, search works very well from a video standpoint, how we label these things and architect these programs. That's where, um, these patient journeys really do help because it helps us understand, you know, uh, Patient A, who's been living with their disease for three years and, you know, is on second, second and third line of therapy, you know, those are some markers that, that tends to um, resonate with somebody who's going through that same journey versus, you know, I'm Jane Smith and I was just uh, diagnosed with diabetes among the millions of other Americans today. Yeah. You know, it, it, you, you kind of need to, to usher them along in their journey and you do need to provide some of those basic materials. But where do you, you know, as a marketer need to make decisions about um, largely serving a very narrow end of the funnel and being able to provide value to them. And then what is the return of that, you know, investment look like? Well, yeah, I'm like so many just questions like pop in my head right now. <laughs> I'm going to stretch this just a little bit more because yeah, yeah. Chris has, God, every time he sends me articles or we even spoke on the phone, I was doing some market research and that's what prompted us to uh, start a conversation again. It just how you just researches all of this amazing stuff. So I mean you guys you know, I'm not even scratching the surface. To warm up, I'm, old. I know. <laughs> I'm not even scratching the surface in your brain, dude. Um, okay, so what can we talk like what is another just to stay focused, you know, because I don't want to get too off track. Like what can we talk to as another campaign that you've run or maybe something you've done in the past um, where you put it out there and this is what returned, and it was strictly video. Or it could be video um, that was mixed in with other things, but video was included. You know, I'll tell you a really good example. I, I didn't do it specifically, but it was done by, uh, by Ogilvy, um, the, uh, the kind of the broader organization I work for. It's um, the Phillips Breathless Choir. Um, you, you may or not be familiar with it. It had won um, several awards this year. Um, it was a video that was produced that talked about a woman who was several people who were suffering from COPD, so uh, you know disease that af that affects your your lung and your lung capacity. And they were putting a choir together, and I'm I'm, I'm going to butcher a little bit the narrative just in the sake of time here, right? But um, if you Google you know Phillips Breathless Choir, you'll get a chance to see this video. But it's a story about this group of people who were brought together by a professional um, choir leader. Um, to help really condition them. And it seems a little counterintuitive. How could these people with the reduced lung capacity be able to participate in an acapella choir, right? Wow. A bit of a challenge. But it really was about training them how to work with the condition that they have. But what you were able to see is this really poignant story about people who were able to participate in a very proficient way um, and challenge themselves to succeed. Um, and it was done so in the narrative of, you know, Philips, an organization that was putting several products in the market to help people who are suffering from respiratory and pulmonary diseases. Um, so affecting, you know, COPD. Yeah. And what you're left with, which is this very touching narrative and a really positive sentiment about, about Philips, completely different way to look at, you know, larger branding. Now, Philips is, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, counseled as such by organizations like Ogilvy um, to really look at what does that branding hallmark look like to an audience who's looking not only patients, but also physicians who are looking to purchase your products. Um, and I talk about this because it was a very long video. I think it was more than six minutes long. And there's some very specific parts of that, you know, as the narrative. Um, we were reusing those videos inside of the marketplace, specifically on um, Facebook, against targeted advertising. And that targeted advertising was looking not only as a list match, against the, the mailing list that they had for us to use as primary targets, but who are the lookalikes? Like if I know, you know, um, I'll include myself in here if you're, you know, a middle-aged dude living in the suburbs and you're looking, um, you know, for, you know, used minivans, right? Yeah. Well, chances are if they run my name and the criteria that makes up Chris Coleman demographically and uh, attitudinally um, against something like Facebook, they're going to find a lot of other Chris Coleman's. I'm not that unique, Right. Well, just because I raised my hand and put my name into a database, I'm willing to bet from the attributes that, that you know, create the profile of me both in behavior and, you know, the demographics that yeah. there's a ton of other middle-aged dudes looking for minivans out there, right? And that's part of how we begin to do this audience growth and begin to experiment with, well, what is the highest return on investment I'm going to get after going to these audiences? And how do I pull the levers and knobs appropriately, and specifically with video? How do I use video to motivate someone like me? to take action yeah. you know what is the creative that's going to resonate and that's where you get into these um the power of being able to use you know some core assets 
and begin to change the narrative, change the score, change the call to action, and change how you're cutting that video to make it more appealing to me versus, you know, there's a, there's a female version of me out there as a decision maker too. There's a younger version of me as a decision maker out there too. And some of the, the visual tools, the, the video tools, the, the narrative tools will work with me and not with the other person. You know, we all have these shared analogies, right? Yes. I'm sure that, you know, in the Venn diagram of interest, we have a lot of overlap and we have a lot of things that are, that are on the outsides. You, know, you can look at music and, and specifically, you know, you've got to kind of have these windows of relevance that kind of open and close based on, you know, um, age and generation. And I think, you know, when we begin to look at the decisions we make as marketers, we need to take those things into account. And video is a really compelling way to do that because it acts on our emotion and we can add music, narrative, voice, visuals, cadence, and really begin to change, you know, how appealing some core assets are just based on how we present them to the user. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, 100%. I mean, I think, uh, I think the key component, which took me a really long time to realize, is when I started, I was a creative visually. And I didn't, when you start off as a young kid and you're doing creative, you don't understand what copywriting is. You don't understand what strategy is like when you're, what's the point, what, what, is the, what are you going to do with this piece once you have it? In the beginning, you're just creating, right. but once you get into marketing, it's, oh, no, you got to literally speak a certain way that's going to be effective. And I think, um, you know, people, what I, I've found is how important copywriters are and how smart they are in their language, because you can have a video, you can have all of this, these really pretty looking things, but if it's if it's not even telling a story, if it's not speaking the right way, it's, it's dead in the water. Well, you know, I just want to add one thing because I think it's really under-recognized is uh, time of day, right? We all have, yeah. a, a, you know, a need, a hunger, a wants to watch something, you know, whatever it is, however it appeals to us. You know, me finding that, that you know, that video that's going to resonate with me in the middle of the day when I happen to be looking for something else for work, for instance, yeah. you could have the best video in the world. It's just not something I can act on. It's not something I can engage with. I can't take the luxury of time. Yeah. But talk to me at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. Well, that's a different thing. So this is like taking the creative practice as to what we're thinking about as, you know, as brand stewards and say like, well, where, how do I, what is the utility of what I'm the dialogue I'm hoping to drive to at what time of day? Yeah. Is this something that's alert driven? You know, like at, you know, 10 o'clock on a Saturday, you can tell me that you've, you've, you know, take the car analogy. You've cut the price of that car in half. And if I act now, I can do it. You give that to me on a Monday morning. I can't do anything with it. You know, like I, I got, I got things I need to do. I got to get to work, you know? Yeah. Same thing with the, the longer narrative. And in particular, how does video fit into that? You know, is it, and I don't believe it's just a morning thing, right, or an evening thing. You know, video actually has a lot of value throughout the day. It's a question of, is it the length? Is it the cadence? Is it the creative? Is it the bumpers you put in front of it? Is the the condition at which you've shown it to me? And, you know, there a lot of people have a lot of stolen moments all day yeah. um, on their phones. And, you know, like, how do I take use of that, that those, those couple of seconds even? To begin to, you know, provide value to, you know, to that user for my brand is, is, you know, am I the brand that's escapism or am I the brand that's that quick point of reference that, you know, little Sally, you know, I just got a call from the, you know, from daycare and little Sally um, is coughing. Like I have to take action on that. Well, right. what's, what's the closest, you know, <laughs> from, you know, uh, CVS or Walgreens or something. And, and what is the brand that actually became top of stack to me? When I make that decision versus I'm going to, I'm going to do some research into really what the best is, you know, what the best product in the market is. You know, is. I mean, in something like that, I, uh, you know, I was talking in the last episode I did and we got towards the end and we were talking about silent video and I was like, you know, I think one of the reasons silent video is so important is because people are watching it in public. I'm like, but other people are watching it while they're like on the toilet. Like people are looking at their phones and if you can speak to them. People are watching it in meetings. Huh? <laughs> you don't think that they're watching it in meetings. Like I've seen it. But it's like w where you are. So maybe there's a, a point of you are a company and you are targeting parents about some kind of medication that they might need for a stomach ache. If you hit them in the morning, you can be very meta and say, hey, I get it. You're at work right now and the day looks great, but you're probably going to get a call around 1030, maybe two about your little kid's sick. If that's the case, you know, this is the product we have. If, I think if yeah. I would almost be like, holy shit, <laughs> that's kind of brilliant. Yeah. And I, I think if you live in that space and say, look, we both know what's happening here. I'm going to speak to you through this little window 
and talk to you as if I'm talking to you right now. You know, and I think if you can, you know, again, that's just a, an idea that popped in my head. But in that time of day, if, you know, if you're doing a strategy, who are we talking to at what time of day? What are we selling? How can we be different from someone else? Maybe talk to them in a realistic way. Or God, d- doesn't it have to be day. different? It can, yeah. You could just be the last brand that talked to me. Yeah. Like you're talking about, you know, selling rock salt to put on my steps. Come on. Yeah. Like no offense to the rock salt people out there, but like, <laughs> if you, you know, you've got the best value or, you know, you, you, you're like, it's no paw hurt or, you know, and I got a dog, like, yeah. you know, it, it's a question of what is the value you're giving to me? Not necessarily your brands. Cause how often am I buying rock salt whilst I'm buying it by the pallet? You know, and, and you know, we get, you got to be honest with yourselves as a brand. I think, you know, we have a conversation with a lot of healthcare brands. Like, are you commoditized or are you, um, you know, are you an emotional purchase? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like what we are. I mean, my company, it's, it's, uh, I try to find that pain point with people or, you know, are you annoyed by consistently having to take a ton of time explaining what your company does? And if I hit that with someone, they're like, yeah. Yeah. Or I'm like, are people walking by your seminar booth and you don't have a video, but the guy next to you did, and they're sitting there staring at it, watching when you, you know what's going on, and you've got nothing. I literally went to a, a convention here in town in Raleigh, and I was taking pictures of people's booths, and I was without video, and I was emailing it to them. I'm like, hey, I said, notice you didn't have a video. How would that how did that work out for you? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it was kind of a dick move. We don't really respond to that, but it's the. It is that pain point of you just spend a ton of money doing this and people and – and I'm watching you guys pitch this idea and it's taking forever and I'm like, I, my eyes are glazing over. But I digress. Um, cool, man. Well, we are at 46 minutes and I do want to cut this short. I don't want to cut it short, but I do try to keep this short. Um, well, you know where to find me. Yeah, dude. But uh, is there anything that you would like to plug at all? Um, you know, I, I, you had mentioned, uh, you know, that I work for Ogilvy Common Health and, you know, um, you know, thrilled to work for the organization. Um, if you're interested in learning about now healthcare marketing, um, you know, we have a blog. I, I have two previous colleagues who, uh, who are working on a, a podcast similar to the one you're producing, RX Digital Marketing, um, that I personally endorse, um. Uh, side note to uh, all the perspectives that I had shared here aren't necessarily representation representing my organization. Um, their opinions are my own, and uh, nice. I'm not uh, paid <laughs> or uh, or paid to speak on anyone's behalf along the way. So this was a uh, casual conversation. Yeah, I mean, good thing we didn't even really name any brands, or you didn't name any brands. I don't think, except for well, I mean, Pepsi Clear. Let's be honest. I mean, I think they are yeah, they're in you your know, pocket. Pepsi, call me. Um, <laughs> I'm not above taking. Uh, Taking uh, sugar water dollars. <laughs> this last, uh, you know, a couple. They were bringing it back. Like I, mean, I know, like last year, they were like, it's yeah, summer, like Pepsi so Clear's coming back." And I was like, "No, oh, that didn't work the first time. Why are we doing it again?" One thing, one thing about for those of you who don't know, Mr. Mike Doyle, um, who has a absolutely tremendous work ethic, and I, I completely endorse everything he does. Um, he tried to hire him several times along the way. As well as referred him out. So, uh, you my actually, hat off to you, sir. My you, hat off to you. You gave me the best financial year through a referral. It was 2008 to 2012, right before I start, started this company. You referred me to Thomas Bono at the Flash. Uh, at, what was that Flash? PCA. Yeah, that Flash thing in Boston. And, uh, I ended up speaking with Thomas and got hired on as freelance for four years on site. And I made so much fucking money <laughs> at that place. It was, I literally, dude, I invoiced them the first week and I'm like, there's no way. There's no way they're, and they're like, they just kept cutting checks. And, but I mean, it showed up. I was, I, I busted my ass. I was doing a lot of these flash E details for doctors. And I was, I, I mean, the amount of money I made was so sick. And that was because you referred me to Thomas. So anybody listening, referrals work, even if you aren't in, in your own business, if you work for someone else, if someone needs a referral, refer them. It, it takes a second. Works for you because you've got the work ethic and you're a closer. Doesn't work for people who don't work. If you are, you have to be a good, you have to be a good source to refer. But if you know someone is going to hustle or it's going to help them, just refer them. I refer 
everybody as much as possible because I think sometimes it's like, why don't you guys just take 10 minutes, have a conversation, and you figure out if there's a fit or not, you know? But it's always good to give. But again, Chris, Coleman, you are awesome. I am going to hit stop, but we can keep talking after this. All right, that is the show. I hope you enjoyed it. If you said, yes, Mike, I certainly did then please message any of your marketing friends and tell them what cool tips you learned that could possibly benefit their lives and make them want to listen to this podcast. Also, check out drive80.com if you are struggling to explain what your company does. We accomplish this in a minute or so with animation. If you have any questions, uh, please send me an email at mike at drive80.com. I'd love to hear some feedback. Tell me what you like. Tell me the things I could fix uh, to really just make these episodes better, really give you guys a lot of value because, again, that is the point. I really want to be very focused on this um, so you're listening to it. Every time you hear it, there's something new, and it really you could take an action with it right there and grow your business or grow your clients' businesses, which will then and help you grow your business because they'll want to pay you more. Again, Mike Doyle, drive80.com. Go in peace.